So we're going to continue in our, our look in the, uh, the book of James. And we began this last week, Jimmy's Book of Wisdom. And James really is a, a writing about maturity, about our Christian depth, our faith, where we're at and what we're doing. Last week we looked at and really started kind of learning a little bit about James, that this is the brother of Jesus. And, and this did not go out to uh, a specific location or a specific church. This was a general epistle uh, and then it was actually sent out to all the churches. There's no indication that James actually was a follower of Jesus during Jesus' time on earth. It actually happened after the crucifixion and resurrection. There's multiple occurrences in Scripture where basically they just said his brothers didn't believe in him or they thought he was out of his mind. But he also then becomes a leader in the church and becomes a leader in the church of Jerusalem. And one of the things we got to make sure that we pull that based on this first little understanding is that God never undermines his people in any way. James wanted to make sure that we understood this. He, we didn't, God doesn't undermine his people in any way, either by testing or by temptation. Rather, he always seeks to build up and bless them. God does not want us to fail. And that would have been contrary to some of the beliefs that we are one of his one-of-kind creations. And that temptation comes to us in three phases. The first one, it comes in enticement. It entices us. The second is this conception of lust and the, the birth of sin. And the final phase is death. So this week, we're going to continue in drilling down in this maturity that if we're really going to be the believers, we're really going to be the people of God, if we're really going to represent him well, then we got to continue to look at our maturity. So let me just kind of back up a little bit. And uh, we're, we're a few weeks away, and Ashley and I, our youngest son, Jake, is going to be heading off to college. But uh, before that, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a little picture, and I did warn him this is happening. Um, we lived on Shaker Drive when we first moved to Valparaiso. And right around the block from where we lived was the preschool that Jake attended, Miss Joe's. He went to Miss Joe's, and, and this is a picture that you'll see of, of him getting ready for preschool. Oh, yeah. There it is. We're in his flip-flops on his bike with the training wheels, the helmet. And you can notice there's a Band-Aid on the elbow. He is ready for preschool. He had it all ready to go. The Band-Aid was from an earlier accident. Do you remember? Do you remember starting out this way? I mean, Jake looks pretty focused on that bike. It cannot fall over, but he's pretty focused. You remember what it was like when you took the training wheels off? Do you remember how scary that was? Do you remember how, how unnerving it was? Because you were, we were all believing we would fall over. And it's so hard to get it through the minds of the people you're teaching to ride the bike, or maybe when you were learning and you're, you, whoever was teaching you, they, it was so hard to get it through our head that for us to keep the bike up, you have to continue to pedal. Because it seems like, maybe in our minds, we associate movement with pain. And that we're afraid that if we start going too fast, that we're going to collapse, we're going to run into something. But really, on a bike, the scariest thing to do is to freeze and be paralyzed in our own fear. Because when you're learning to ride a bike, you have to move. You have to to move. We can't stay still. And if you remember when you were teaching or when you were being taught that, that when they would start and you would, do I go, do I go, do I go, do I go? And, and then you start trying to negotiate the front wheel to try to buy you some balance. See, on our faith journey, it can be so scary because it requires us to keep moving forward. As soon as we stop, as soon as we stop, we have the potential to fall over. Now today, we're going to be in James, we're going to be in chapter 1, 2, and 3, taking sections out of each like we did last week. But if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to James chapter 1, we'll be there. If not, you can look on the YouVersion Bible app, go to live event, there's VNC, all of our notes and quotes will be there as well. So we're going to begin today, James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. 
Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he'll be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Now, D James is confronted at what he perceived to be a tremendous contrast between behavior and belief. The behavior and belief were not adding up. That people would say they believed one way and then would act a totally opposite manner. Now, this is James roughly 2,000 years ago, was confronting, confronting the early church that believe, belief and behavior are not adding up. Now, a phrase I use all the time, and you'll hear around here, is our creed and our deed. That what we say we are, who we say we are, and then what we actually do, if they're not in alignment, then we've got an issue. Now, James believed that this was an issue in the early church roughly 2,000 years ago, and here we are in 2019, and I believe what he's talking about is pretty relevant. In fact, it's spot on. See, I believe, after doing a little research, I came away, I, I, I study in this, that there are really two reasons, two reasons someone leaves the church. There's two reasons, and really all of them kind of boil down to this. One, they've been hurt. They've been hurt. Somebody in the church, the pastor did so. I can't imagine the pastor doing anything wrong. But <laughs> let's just assume that's right. Somebody said something to me. We acted poorly. We made a mistake. It was misguided. Either way, someone got hurt. Someone got hurt. And when we've been hurt... The easiest thing to do is to just bolt. That's it. It's easy. Because then I don't have to deal with it. I can just put it to bed and I can move on. So if we've been hurt, somebody did me wrong, somebody, it was intentional, if it, if it was not intentional, whatever. And, and the other one is that they begin living their life contrary to the teachings of the word. I mean, there does come a point, right? I mean, there does come a point that if you are hearing truth spoken, you are being forced to be in groups. We are encouraging you to be in this study, to read this, and to do this. We're encouraging you to sing these silly worship songs about praising God. And there just comes a point that if your life, if you are living contrary to the Word of God, then something's got to change. Either this work, this work of the Holy Spirit begins to change you from the inside out, and you say, you know what, there's some truth there, and what I've been believing, living, and doing is wrong, so I'm going to change myself. Or we say, that's nuts, I don't want to hear that anymore, because I leave every Sunday feeling bad. I came here to feel good. I, I, I came to church because I wanted to see my family. I wanted to see my friends. I, there were some people I went to school with. Maybe we worked together. I, I, I enjoy being around them. And so, so I want to come and be a part of that. I like them. And, and the music, that's pretty good. And, and that guy, he's funny every once in a while. So I, I can do this. But there comes a point in our spiritual maturity, in our journey that you and I are on, that if truth is being spoken and our lives do not reflect that very truth, then either we got to change what we listen to or we got to change the way we live. So I believe two reasons really come down to, I've been hurt by people, and as we know, people hurt people. We do it all the time. And then in our own life, we have to make a decision. And see, what happens is in multiple articles that there are people who are talking about this in the, in the church, that people are taking their faith and is shaping it to believe whatever they want. That truth is not near as important as feeling good. That I'd rather feel good than listen to the truth. George Barna was quoted, and he's a stat guy, and he said, people say, I believe in God, I believe the Bible is a good book, and then I believe whatever I want. 
With a wry hint of exaggeration, America is headed towards 310 million people with 310 million beliefs. So the person that hears the truth and then fails to live it is doing two things to themselves. The person that hears two things, uh, excuse me, the person that hears truth and then fails to live it out are doing two things to themselves. The first one, they deceive themselves. That if we hear it, but we don't adjust to it, then we are deceiving ourselves. We're lying to ourselves. We're basically swallowing the lie. I mean, we've all heard the term hypocrite, right? We've all heard that. It's been thrown out. But it becomes a very real active part. We tell ourselves that the sin that I am willfully engaging in is not that harmful. We begin to say that the sin that I am engaging in, now the sin that you are engaging in, I can see it from a mile away, and you are a hypocrite, but the sin that I'm engaging in is really not that bad. It is so easy to see everybody else's stuff. And especially if you post it. You post it on social media, I don't even have to go to your house to tell you. I can just write a little comment. Stupid. <laughs> right? But the sin that I willfully engage in, that I say, you know, it may be right, it may be wrong for you, but it's not wrong for me. So we are deceiving ourselves. We deceive. The second thing is we hinder. See, when we deceive ourselves, then we're not giving ourselves the full benefit of growth. In, in other words, we're, we're undermining our own spiritual potential. Now, last week we talked about we had plans for finance. We got, we got plans for the gym. We got plans on, on vacation. We got plans and we prepare. We save. We do whatever it takes. We, we lay out these plans of what we want to accomplish. But in our spiritual journey, in our spiritual life, we tend to... Just say, wherever the Lord wants to take me. Now, at first, that sounds very spiritual and honest, but actually it's unbelievably lazy because we're not taking any accountability for our spiritual journey, and it's lazy. So when we hinder ourselves, we are eliminating, eliminating the potential for spiritual growth. It's like saying, I've joined the Y, I'm going to go work out, and then I stop at Dunkin' Donuts for a box on the way home because it says, well, it cancels out the calories. So we're, not, we're hindering ourselves, we're hindering ourselves for being all that God has called us to be. We're hurting ourselves. So this authentic Christian life is not a matter of learning theory but applying it into practice. See, our creed and our deed must be in alignment. They must be in alignment. And you know people, and I know people, I run around with people, you run around with people, they are out of alignment. They're out of alignment. See, we are missing it as a group of people because our authenticity and integrity is in question. And Jesus had a way about him that he gathered all of the disenfranchised, those that were lacking in integrity. He only got angry at the spiritually elite. See, in verse 25, it said that James speaks of this perfect law of liberty or the truth. It's amazing that James is speaking about this truth or this law of liberty not as confinements or boundaries that are prohibitive, but this perfect law of liberty is referring to full freedom through the truth of God's plan. See, ultimately, the person accepts, believes, obeys, and they begin to pursue the freedom that God is offering us through his son, Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, you can't just hear it and then ignore it. You got to do something with it. You got to process it. You got to act upon it. You got to do something with it because you've been given the truth. You've been given the truth. 
And then he goes on, and I, and I think these things are totally, when, when you first read that first section of chapter one, you think, well, it's two issues here. There's the one of, about understanding the truth, and then the second part, it says, it starts talking about the tongue. And you're like, that's two different things, but I think they're actually bound together. I mean, have you, have you been told your mouth is going to get you in trouble? Raise your hand. Come on. Don't lie. There you go. How many of you have heard, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all? You ever heard that? Okay. All right. How about your mouth is going to overload your backside? Yeah, that's for the older people. I'm with you. Yeah, there's belts involved. Okay. And, and did any of you buy the lie, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's garbage. Words hurt. Words hurt. Words hurt when you're five and when you're 85. They hurt when you're at your kid's ball game, when you're at the gym. Your words hurt when you're at work. And words hurt out there in the lobby and in our parking lot. So if we're not allowing truth to penetrate who we are, we're letting it hinder, we're letting it deceive, and then all of a sudden James runs right into your mouth is an issue. It was an issue 2,000 years ago. They didn't even have social media. 2,000 years ago, it was an issue in the early church that people's mouths, they were saying things that hurt others. Now, I'm not talking about being soft. I'm not talking about, this is about you and I, that the actions we have in our life are not aligning with what comes out of our mouth. I mean, how hard is it really? I would give anything. I am sure you are in the same boat. There are so many times in my life that I have said things out loud that I wish the magic eraser could and get that undone because I see the effects. I see what it's done. There's so many times I wish I could take it back. I wish time travel was real and I could just fast forward and rewind. See, the tongue is directly related to the brain. And for many of us, what comes in here comes out here. Sometimes it's okay to let it process before it comes out. And you and I are living in a new day that everybody's a writer, a reporter, and a photographer. And everything we encounter, we document, or somebody's documenting it. It used to be a big deal to be published. Everybody's published now. We assume everybody wants to know what we think, that our opinion is really valued. And we've overshadowed the reality of just how harmful our words are. Dr. Haider Zahid wrote this. He said, words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively using words of despair. Words have energy and power with the ability to help, to heal, to hinder, to hurt, to harm, to humiliate, and to humble. I mean, I don't know about you, but I would have much rather taken a spanking than a talking to. Just hit me and get it over with. But the lecture, that was was like torture. When they said, I am not proud of what you just did. I'm like, oh, forget it. Hit me. (laughs) Get it over with. But there's something about this. That our mouth, our words, are so powerful that you and I are doing damage to our Christian faith and our walk. And we are doing damage to the very church we say we love when we go out and we say we're one thing and this spews out. And that goes for writing it and typing it. But the things that come out of here do harm to your faith. The words that come out of my mouth do harm to our faith. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. It's a dangerous tool. Verse 14 of chapter 2 says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? 
Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not accomplished by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith and by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Now, it, here, here's the thing. You know, we were talking about the bike, and it is really hard to ride a bike with one leg. It is just it is really hard. If you've only got your foot on one pedal, it is just really hard to maintain and keep the crank going. And the crank is the piece that the chain wraps around that propels the back tire. And so when you are trying to do it one-legged, it is just unbelievably hard. You can try it for a short time, but it's going to wear you out. It just really doesn't work. See, the way a bicycle works properly is when both pedals are pushed simultaneously and the crank works by pulling the chain, propelling the back tire. You see, faith and deeds are like the two pedals on the crank. That when someone says they have faith and the other person has deeds, well, if you only are going with one, I mean, it, it, when someone comes in and they're telling you about their pain and they haven't eaten in three days and, and they're starving, they're not going to figure it out. And you say, man, that's terrible. I'll be praying for you. Our words are empty. It's when we grab them a burger, sit down with them. Give them the burger. So now it's not only just what we believe, it's what we do. So our creed and our deed are working together. Our faith and our actions are in alignment because they work together. We can't have one without the other. We, we can't just try to do this one-legged. And there are people that will believe that I can do enough good things to be in right relationship with God. And there's others that believe all I got to do is believe. So in, in essence, that I can make a decision when I'm a small child that, yes, I, I am in, and then my life never adds up to it, ever. I'm not a part of community. I'm not a part of serving. I'm not a part of worshiping. But I made a decision when I was five, and I've done nothing for 50 years. Then our creed and deed are not in alignment. And so when James says the demons believe and shudder, you don't see that a lot in the church. Because our, feet, our, 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 our pedals have got to work together. That's the only way to keep the bike moving forward. That's the only way to keep the bike moving forward is when we're pedaling them together. Verse 20 of chapter 2 says, You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. See, in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the book of Malachi and to the New Testament in Matthew, when we see the, 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 the coming of Christ, there was a number of Jewish writers that began really elevating the giving of alms. And that, that's like an offering or, or a, a charity, basically. Charity. And they began to almost, in that 400 years, almost began to believe that, that was kind of compared, that set a whole new set of rules in what it means to be charitable. And that started almost being compared to the book of Moses, which is the law, which is where we see the Ten Commandments and things. And so the, the, the Jewish church began, or the Jewish faith and the people, started really pushing this, that basically if I did enough good, giving of enough alms, or being enough char uh, charitable, especially to the widows, the poor, and the orphans, they were really, really great of being charitable. And they were serious about taking care of the down and out. So the question began to rise, is that enough? Now, I know that that was 2,000 plus years ago, 
but I believe that has creeped into our culture as well. We got enough charities. <laughs> there, is a, there is a banner for everything, and there's a give $10 here, give $5 there, sponsor this, sponsor that. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. That's not what I'm saying. But for us in 2019, for those of us that live in the West, we've kind of let this creep in to where, is that just good enough? Is that good enough? I'm a good person. I help fight cancer. I help fight diabetes. I help I helped raise money for the family that lost a child. I, I have helped here and I've helped there. Doggone it, that's not bad. And if, if, if we're playing, you know, Monopoly, it's not. But we're not playing Monopoly. It's our life. And our charity is not going to get us where we need to be in our spiritual walk with the Heavenly Father. We have a higher calling than to be charitable. See, this, this first century Christians had to battle the, the talk of works and faith, that what they believed and what they do, that their creed and a deed were not in alignment. Paul boldly proclaimed in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, works should flow naturally from faith. It should flow naturally from our faith. It's all good behavior should flow from your right beliefs. That our creed and our deed must be in alignment. See, there was this Greek philosopher during this time that James would have been writing this. And, and it was, uh, the, the, the Greek philosopher had this belief system, this, this stoicism that was basically just said reject all emotion. And stoics, and when we hear that word, you, you know, you come across as stoic, is where it comes from. Basically, if good or bad happen to you, you don't show any emotion or expression. But what happened is that Greek philosophy began to make its way into the church. And so when people would come forward with real needs... because we believe that's the way we should act. People that had lost their homes and family, they'd been persecuted for the church because of their faith, and all of a sudden they came to the other believers, and they were denied or rejected or never empathized. They were withholding aid. So James is hitting this hard to make sure everybody understands that works without faith produce nothing that counts for eternity. And faith without works produces nothing that meets earthly needs. The two belong together in this dynamic synergy. Faith producing works. Verse 3 of chapter, of chapter 3 says this in James. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or we can take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, it sets the whole course of one's life on fire and in itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And then he says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt, a salt spring, produce fresh water. Now, that seemed like a tongue lashing. That James wanted to make sure, again, it's got this moment where he starts down this path and it's like, and don't let me forget this. And he comes back to it in three, and he says that your mouths, 
that are sharing, as we talk about creed and deed, that on one day of the week you are singing these praises, and then during the rest of the week you're acting a different way. And that was an issue 2,000 years ago in the early church. 2,000 years ago. So here we are today. Here we are today reading what James is saying, that fresh water and salt water cannot come out of the same spring. Our creed and our deed have got to be in alignment. Now, I believe, I told you last week, that James, little, he was the little brother of Jesus, probably heard some of the same things. Well, we see in Matthew 23, Jesus has some, some thoughts that he shares. It says, then Jesus in 23, verse 1, then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees that sit in Moses' seat, you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And then he goes on in verse 23. You skip on down. It says, woe to you, teachers of the law, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So Jimmy's little book of wisdom, he got some stuff from his older brother. But there's something about this. The only time that we see Jesus get ticked off in Scripture, it was to the spiritual elite. So in other words, it was to the people that said one thing, and they did another. That our creed and our deed must be in alignment. Our creed and our deed must be in alignment. You know, and you've been on you've been on those bikes. You've you've ridden and and you know you we put the helmets on and some put the elbow pads on and the knee pads. But there comes this point in time in your faith where you got to take those training wheels off, and it's scary. I get it. It's scary. But the only way to keep from falling over is for the creed and deed to go in alignment and to go and to push and to go forward. And it takes a little time, takes a little effort. We wobble, we wobble. There's times you're going to fall, you're going to need a Band-Aid, you got to get back on the bike, and you got to keep going, you got to keep riding, you got to keep pedaling, you got to keep going forward. And James is imploring us to ride, to push, to go, to do, that our faith and our deeds have got to be together. They've got to keep going. And if those are things are in alignment, if those things are really in alignment, if our creed and demon, if our creed and deed are meshed and they're doing in alignment together, then our mouth is in check. Our mouth's in check. Now we're gonna we're gonna sing one more praise song before we close today, but I I, I just want to encourage you. Maybe today, maybe today, if you would like to pray. Because you're, if you would just do a little self-evaluation, this isn't anybody throwing rocks and judgment at you, but if you would say, hey, the things I say in my life, they're out of whack. Man, I'd love to pray with you. Maybe you'd say, I've got an issue. I've got an issue. My mouth is overloading my backside. There are times I just let it rip. And when I do, there's a path of destruction. That's not the way God wants us to live at all. So I invite you to stand now. I want to pray for you. We're going to sing this, this worship song together. But as I pray, if you would like to come, then I invite you. No judgment, no rocks, just you and God, just to say, God, I need you. I need you. I cannot ride my bike without you. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are, and we just ask now that you be with our people. As we have to make these decisions on going forward, that we must pedal, and that our faith and deeds, our creed and our deed must be in alignment. And Father, I just ask that you give us the courage and the awareness to be the men and women you've called us to be. 
We ask these things, your most precious and holy name. And everybody said,